Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, uh, or good noon, I should say, as of two minutes ago. Uh, my name is Benjamin Payloff. I am the director of the Center for Russian East European and Eurasian Studies here at the University of Michigan, as well as professor of Slavic languages, literatures, and comparative literature. Um, it is my great privilege to uh, welcome you all to uh, today's Crease noon lecture. Uh, entitled From Bad to Worse, U.S.-Russian Relations Against the Backdrop of the Ukraine Crisis. Um, this is our last new lecture of the term, uh, but there is one event I do want to uh, bring your attention to, to bring to your attention, uh, that is a, an event of potential interest being organized by an alumnus of the Center for Russian and European Eurasian Studies. Uh, that, the alumnus is Olga Virohovska, who completed her MA in Greece in uh, 1996, and is the lead archivist for collections management at the Bentley Historical Library here at the University of Michigan. And uh, she will be uh, leading a, an event on Thursday, December 8th, that's um, tomorrow, uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Detroit Observatory uh, at 1398 East Ann Street, uh, the uh, event is entitled Michigan Archives Nights at the Detroit Observatory, the American North Russia, uh, North Russia Expeditionary Force in Arkansas. Uh, so this will be um, uh, tomorrow from 7 to 9 at the Detroit Observatory. Uh, so again, this is the last uh, pre noon lecture of the semester, although I have to tell you it has been well over a year, I think, in the making, and I especially want to uh, thank uh, Liz Malinkin, who's uh, just returned from attorney leave. Welcome. Uh, uh, so before going on leave, for many months, Liz was putting this uh, event together and uh, handed the logistical task off to Arthur Gozi, who's also done a wonderful job there. All, all semester, not just in arranging uh, this event, but really keeping the lights on uh, in this uh, temporary absence. We are uh, eternally grateful to Arthur for um, making what are really two very smooth transitions uh, administratively. I know that that's not the sort of thing that's necessarily visible to the end users <laughs> who come to our events. If it's not visible to you, that means it went well. <laughs> so when 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 things don't have hiccups, it's because people made those hiccups go away in advance. So I want to make sure that we're not looking at it. Um, I also want to welcome uh, any participants who are joining us over Zoom. Uh, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, we have remained open to hybrid events, both with an in-person audience, which is if you're watching over Zoom, you don't see that this is a room filled with people. And if you're in the room filled with people, you don't necessarily know that this is also a virtual space with something like 40 or 50 people already uh, uh, joining us uh, online. And if you are joining us online, you are invited to participate in the conversation following the presentations uh, by uh, providing questions or brief comments in the Q&A function on Zoom at the bottom of your screen. So this event uh, featuring the Levada Center and the Chicago Council on Global, Global Affairs is a presentation that will unpack the results of a joint public opinion research project by both centers that was started in 2017 with a specific focus on which narratives about the conflict are having the most influence on public perception regarding the ongoing war in Ukraine what paths to a resolution of the conflict each public might see as acceptable and how opinion has evolved over the past year. The talk will also look to the future, touching on the threats that both publics sense going forward and the views of younger generations of Russians and Americans. You can read the results of the American surveys in both the Washington Post. Uh, the title of the post is a support slipping for Inde Inde indefinite US aid to Ukraine uh, poll finds. Uh, as well as um, the, uh, at the Chicago Council for Global Affairs, where the uh, title we'd be looking for is Growing U.S. Divide on How Long to Support Ukraine. Both articles are available online. Now, uh, our speakers are, oh, and thank you, uh, Liz has put the, um, the, the links in the chat uh, for you if, um, if you wish to uh, 
jump over to those documents. So our speakers uh, in order are uh, Denise Volker, uh, Stepan Gancharov, and Dina Smeltz. Um, I believe that Denise is already with us, uh, and Stepan will be joining us from an airport uh, at some point in the next few minutes, we hope. Um, uh, just a brief note about each speaker. Denise Volkov, uh, who's on the screen already, is the director of the Levada Center, a Moscow-based independent sociological research organization. Over 15 years with the center, he has been involved in more than 100 quantitative and qualitative research projects on various aspects of Russian society. Stepan Bechlov is a senior research fellow at the Levada Center and his field of expertise and research interests include public opinion on international relations, use of media, and modern social processes in Russia. And Dina Smeltz is a senior fellow for public opinion and US foreign policy at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. She's physically present in the room. Um, uh, and uh, at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, she oversees the Council's annual survey of American attitudes for foreign policy and has authored many analyses based on that work. Uh, we were very excited to have this presentation in the works before February 24th mm -hmm. and have been wondering since February 24th whether this would happen, <laughs> whether, the, whether the various pieces would allow this to happen. Uh, we're very fortunate that it has come together. We're very grateful that you was able to join us and that uh, Denise and Stefan will join us uh, online. And so without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming our three speakers. So Denise, I think you can just start off. Uh, if okay. I, I, I just did yeah. want to just note that um, these results, the Russian results, they're fresh off the press. We've shared them uh, just informally with one other group, but they're not public yet. We're happy to share the report and the numbers next week when they are public, but we wanted to you know, give you uh, a very top of the moment uh, reading of what's going on. So. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be uh, with you. And indeed, uh, we are presenting uh, another wave of uh, our five-year cooperation with the uh, Chicago Council uh, on Global Affairs. And uh, I think it uh, gives us uh, a comparative perspective of uh, both societies, uh, American and Russian, on uh, not only uh, this this uh, time on Ukraine, but uh, previously on other issues as well. But of course, uh, uh, the conflict, uh, Russia-Ukrainian conflict is, I think, number one topic right now. And uh, so we uh, decided to uh, look at, uh, at it more closely. So I'm, uh, I will uh, try to... Um, share the Russian part first. I hope Stepan can uh, join us. Uh, he's traveling and uh, so uh, there can be some difficulties. Uh, we can, I think, go to the first slide. Um, let, me uh, let me know if you... Okay, yes. Uh, uh, methodology, <clears throat> it is, um, we used our regular omnibus face-to-face uh, -face survey to get the results uh, on um, uh, Russian public opinion. You see it's uh, uh, 1,600 national representative. Yeah, and uh, so you see the dates, but let's go. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, actually, here you can see the um, response rates, uh, which being uh, calculated uh, on the basis of the uh, APOR uh, uh, recommendations. And uh, here you see that uh, though we had slight decrease in um, and response rate in this year, uh, we don't, if we compare it not only with the uh, last year, but the beginning of last year, it's more or less 
uh, more or less the same. Well, though slight decrease in uh, response rate, though not uh, uh, very big. And uh, actually, uh, to re we do this, of course, in uh, every survey, we calculate the response rate. But this is, we, we share it to uh, address the criticism and uh, the talks that uh, since the beginning of uh, SMO, uh, this special operation conflict, uh, there was a significant drop in response rate. We do not see this, though there was some, but not uh, that big. We also try to address some other criticism and uh, uh, there is on our website some uh, additional surveys that we did and also some additional analysis. For example, there was recently criticism and uh, allegations that uh, uh, nowadays all uh, many interviews are, are, uh, are dropped uh, right uh, when, they, uh, when the people are asked about Ukraine. Actually, it's not true, and it's about uh, one and one point five percent of uh, breakages of the uh, of the interviews on the topic of Ukraine, and the majority is at the very beginning when people uh, are deciding whether they uh, they are ready or not to take the survey, and uh, it's usually not on the political issue. So, but uh, it is good to uh, have all this uh, criticism because it helps us to uh, look at these issues more thoroughly. I think we can uh, uh, postpone it for Q&A and uh, here, uh, yes, please, next slide, uh, this slide and then uh, this, uh, uh, the, the next one will be about uh, uh, one issue. Uh, I would say that the, the dynamic of uh, social uh, sentiment and which uh, gives you an idea both both this approval rating of Putin and assessment of situation of the country gives you an idea of uh, first that uh, we see the rally behind the flag happening. Um, actually, well, the biggest increase from February to March which is uh, uh, almost uh, identical to what we had in 2014. Uh, but, uh, but also we see here it uh, uh, was beginning already by the end of uh, last year, so pre-war, pre so, uh, so to speak. Uh, before any, anything happened, we already saw that, uh, for example, the approval rating of Putin was growing uh, against the escalation of the situation. And also the second, uh, uh, the second issue, probably uh, better we can see on the next slide, but uh, here as well, let's go to the next slide, which is the joint uh, social sentiment index that we calculate from different, uh, different um, questions. You see the consolidation, the rally behind the flag happening first, uh, but also then uh, the drop, which, uh, which came when the uh, decision of partial mobilization was taken. So there are two main dates in our figures. Uh, 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 if we look at the dynamics of the situation of how people feel themselves, how they answer the questions, not only about uh, themselves, but also about the special operation. It's uh, the 20... 4th of February is the start of uh, the hostilities, but also the 21st of September when, uh, when actually people felt for the first time probably that it will, it might, uh, it might um, concern themselves directly. I mean that uh, for seven months, uh, the majority was uh, uh, looking at what was happening very that they saw it as a remote uh, distance war, distance uh, conflict. Uh, and, uh, uh, and only in September, uh, many people suddenly for themselves understood that yes, it can, uh, uh, can, uh, can uh, affect them themselves uh, directly. 
uh, partly because the criteria of this uh, this, uh, this mobilization was so vague that uh, it meant that almost everyone uh, could have been recruited. But uh, let's go to the next slide uh, and um, see uh, how people see the reasons of uh, uh, of uh, why uh, uh, Russia. Sorry, uh, somebody is saying something. No, everything's good. Continue. Uh -huh, okay. Um, so uh, two uh, two measurements. Uh, uh, we actually done them uh, uh, in March and November uh, together with the uh, uh, Chicago Council, and uh, you can see that uh, more uh, well people understood better. Uh, Initially, then, uh, then further, uh, then further in uh, in the year, but still, uh, more or less, we see uh, the same uh, the same pattern. Uh, the main idea is that uh, uh, Russia got involved to help Russian speaking population of Donbas, and uh, and um, kind of a. a had to do this as a preemptive strike. In focus groups, we heard many uh, people explaining to us that, uh, uh, I can give you a quote, that Russia is being dragged into the war. That uh, it's not we who started it, it's the West, the United States uh, predominantly, and uh, Russia was only answering this uh, uh, this threat, it's how the um, uh, Russian authorities shape it, and also how it is uh, more or less uh, uh, the same, uh, how it is reflected in the public opinion. So let's go, uh, let's go further and look at the uh, support uh, uh, and um, uh, support of the Russian military, uh, what the Russian military is um, uh, doing in Ukraine, and uh, well, uh, I have several uh, points to make here. Is uh, first of all, uh, you see that uh, we have very slight decrease in support, very slight, but maybe first uh, uh, major uh, a major change was again in September. Uh, when again after the uh, partial mobilization was announced, and uh, uh, people are since then are less uh, uh, less interested in uh, in uh, uh, this to go on, and it will be reflected more in the uh, question about the peace talks. But here as well, we have some first initial changes, visible changes in September. Also, I think it is important to, uh, first of all, look at the uh, first uh, figure, which is definitely yes. And uh, again, if we compare, uh, if we uh, uh, listen to the people who are doing the uh, uh, list survey experiments, they also, uh, in the very beginning, came up uh, with the figures of about roughly 50% supporting. And uh, I think it's uh, more or less... Uh, uh, coincide with this figure who definitely support, who support without any qualms, who do not uh, have uh, much uh, hesitation about it. And, uh, but uh, when we uh, talk about a majority supporting a Russian military, it's uh, exactly that part of it have definite support, uh, but uh, about 30% all this time uh, was supporting with uh, many, many reservations and uh, rather uh, joining the bigger part of society. And, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, these 30% are those who, on, only those who are afraid to say otherwise. And probably we have some people there in this 30% of those who just in case decide to join the majority. But uh, when we talk with people on focus groups, uh, well, they give the reasons that uh, maybe, yes, maybe it's uh, very upsetting, it's uh, not maybe right to, uh, that the people are dying, but uh, it is for the government to decide. They probably 
knew that uh, uh, what they were doing and uh, this is not the time for criticism when it started we should we should not criticize the authorities because they know that and this is i think uh, with uh, many uh, uh, different uh, different estimates of what is happening. This is one of, I think, uh, major important things that the majority um, delegate uh, the decision to the authorities, like saying, we are small, ordinary people, we don't influence anything, so let's go and decide. And we will just wait and see. So uh, uh, let's go go further. And uh, here are some uh, feelings uh, about the uh, military operation, uh, uh, but also with you can see how uh, people who support and not support uh, uh, have different feelings. And actually, these are different, rather different uh, audiences. Those who support, it's predominantly older uh, public uh, who is uh, more dependent on the state. And I would say during uh, last year's uh, older TV viewers and uh, uh, especially outside of big cities, this is, this is the audience who supported Putin, supported the authorities, supported almost any political decision they were doing, uh, they were making. And uh, so they're supporting uh, this decision as well. And younger, uh, younger internet users, uh, biggest cities, they have uh, more criticism, though again many of them support as well. But if we look for the uh, criticism, we uh, look in these uh, groups. And again, for five years, these were the groups who had uh, much criticism to any governmental decision. Uh, decision. And to add to this slide, uh, if you look in the dynamics, the feeling that people are having, uh, we see that again, slightly, a slight decrease in uh, numbers uh, of those who have uh, pride in Russia, or proud of Russia. So these uh, in dynamics also one of the uh, signs that uh, people are started to getting tired of, uh, of what is happening. So, uh, I do not uh, see whether Stepan has joined us, and I can. Yes, I'm here. Uh, maybe, maybe then uh, he can uh, uh, go further. And uh, yeah, please, Stepan. Uh, okay, uh, please. Next slide. Um, okay, uh, and uh, here we see um, uh, what what uh, the effect uh, will have the military operation. Uh, um, on the situation in Russia uh, or uh, how it will affect uh, relations with the West. Uh, and here we see uh, that number of those who um, uh, think that Russia will increase its political influence, uh, well, uh, it's, 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 quite, it's relatively larger than uh, those who think that it will somehow improve economic welfare or economic situation. Uh, and um, this is uh, um, perceived by some part of Russians like a sacrifice uh, that we have to sacrifice our um, economic well-being in, in some sometimes to uh, defend a uh, country um, in the conflict against against not not only Ukraine but the whole world as it presented uh, by uh, Russian state TV and uh, uh, Russian state speakers as well. Uh, so um, th that's uh, very important to understand that uh, still a large number of uh, people believe that it will influence um, the uh, political power of Russia and it will improve its uh, position in the world. Uh, and that's why uh, the support uh, does not decrease that much as it could be expected by uh, some experts who uh, are talking only about economic figures. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, here is uh, the uh, here is the most important th threats for Russian national interests, um, and uh, here we see that um, 
the threat of uh, nuclear weapon exchange is on the top and it's um, very uh, it has very stable position on the top uh, we and and when uh, there were rumors around uh, the possible nuclear attack uh, or nuclear conflict uh, then uh, we also saw a large rise of uh, anxiety uh, not only about mobilization but as well about uh, the uh, whole outcome of the conflict how it may end um, and uh, okay and uh, again we see that um, uh, that importance of physical uh, safety is very uh, is very large we understand that uh, you know, for example such threats like climate change or even economic downturn they're not as uh, relevant for Russians now as um, as military conflicts or possible terroristic attacks, something like this. And again, we see that uh, that immigration, uh, the threat of immigration, uh, does not perceived like a big threat uh, by large part of society. Even when we conducted focus groups on this topic, uh, uh, there were, the, um, uh, of course, there were some. Um, Replics that, uh, 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 of course, uh, the most, uh, the utmost um, um, best specialists are leaving the country, especially IT um, specialists and those who earned uh, their money uh, by their wisdom and um, intellect. Uh, but uh, at the same time, a lot of respondents answered that uh, among them, there are a lot of uh, bloggers or showmen or the stars which d d d d d does not have a very um, good image inside Russian society and that's why uh, this um, uh, wave of uh, immigrants was perceived like something that uh, very very rich people were leaving the country and um, ordinary Russians did not have much empath empathy for them. Uh, the next slide please. Uh -huh. uh, here we see that um, uh, number of those who think that the Russian uh, military, special military operation is um, successful uh, is decreasing gradually, and maybe it's uh, it, it's decreasing more rapidly uh, than the total support of uh, the operation, as you may have seen before. Uh, and uh, here we understand that uh, even understanding that uh, the total outcome of the operation or um, um, or the situation um, on the frontier right now is not very good but it's still uh, a lot of most of the Russians still support even with knowing with knowledge of uh, such problems uh, on the frontier uh, and uh, still we see uh, that it, it does not lead uh, to uh, dissatisfaction of uh, the special operation um, as a whole. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and um, again, with uh, um, decreasing um, um, with, with decreasing number of people who think that it's successful, uh, we see increasing number of people who th talk about peace negotiations, and uh, we see that uh, it's not uh, increasing uh, probably uh, very, very, very quickly. Uh, but of course, uh, we understand that willingness to negotiate uh, will increase, uh, and uh, still uh, it. Um, uh, the, uh, the reasoning of the operation uh, is becoming under question. Uh, and uh, uh, at least uh, we see that, of course, people understand that, yes, uh, um, we should continue the operation, but uh, it should uh, have an end. Somehow it will end. Um, and now uh, it's opening, uh, the, it is opening the floor for the ideas how it will end. And, and of course, when people uh, talk about uh, peace negotiations, they think about um, peace negotiations uh, on um, 
on the positions of uh, on, uh, from the position of power that Russia should uh, stay with its within its positions and uh, it should not uh, lose any uh, territories gained uh, during the conflict or it should not lose uh, its um, um, public image as a um, as a superpower in the world it's a uh, it's a very important uh, for Russians, even if they understand that uh, we should go for negotiations now. Uh, okay, uh, probably the next slide, please. Uh -huh. um, and here we compared um, how um, how answers or how willingness for negotiations uh, will uh, be uh, will be affected uh, by different treatments. We asked uh, respondents uh, whether they agree to pay higher prices uh, and continue a special operation uh, or uh, Russia should enter these negotiations. Uh, and uh, for the next subsample, uh, we asked um, whether Russia should continue uh, with increase um, of the risk uh, for, uh, for mobilized soldiers uh, uh, with increased risk or that a larger number of people will, will be um, affected by the mobilization. Um, uh, we see that uh, in, in, both, uh, in both cases, um, uh, relatively higher number of people uh, said that Russia should seek uh, for uh, peace negotiations. Uh, but um, when we asked about um, the risk of lives, uh, then number of those who uh, wanted to enter peace negotiations was more. Mm, and also, if we uh, look uh, into um, uh, the social demographic details, uh, we'll see that uh, women, uh, people of uh, uh, my younger generation, uh, they, uh, they react uh, on this treatment even more than in general. Uh, uh, but uh, those who are, for example, but, but those who are uh, have um, quite, uh, who, who are well off, who are well secured, financially secured, uh, they still uh, persist on um, continuing uh, the special operation. Uh, it's a, it, it is a very interesting fact. Uh, we also saw something similar in our previous research, uh, more uh, poor, poorer people, uh, they asked for negotiations and asked for ending their special operations more than those who uh, have uh, quite uh, stable and uh, high income. Uh, but yeah, and, and this uh, it was repeated, this situation repeated uh, in our um, survey this time. Uh, and uh, the next one, please. And here we asked about um, how uh, this conflict may end, uh, what Russia uh, should ask or should sacrifice uh, to end this conflict. And here we see that, uh, yes, the territorial concessions have very low support. They seem to, you know, from our focus groups, we know that uh, any concessions uh, seem like defeat uh, because uh, this conflict was uh, initiated to defend uh, not only population but also ter ter territories. Uh, and uh, if uh, Russia lose uh, DPR or LPR or even Crimea, um, then of course uh, it will and very negatively affect um, the public opinion uh, on uh, probably their own perception, uh, how they perceive themselves like a nation or how they think about government as well. Uh, but, and uh, the highest support um, is, for, um, is for not very uh, hard to uh, conduct measures like uh, exchange uh, of uh, prisoners of war uh, or assurance uh, or, or giving guarantees to Russia that uh, Russian speaking population will not be uh, affected in any way. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, we see that all plausible for Russia uh, outcomes are perceived very well, and uh, probably uh, those uh, 
uh, statements, those conditions um, are what people think about when they talk about peace negotiations as uh, the desirable um, the desirable outcome uh, right now. Uh, I think that's it. Okay, uh, this is the slide by uh, about uh, Ukrainian figures. I think mm. I'm, I'm not sure if I was supposed to comment on it. So this is an excellent question from our live audience here uh, on the campus of the University of Michigan. It, the question is to ask um, about the demographic characteristics of the people of the population specifically being surveyed in Russia? How do they break down by age, gender, uh, political orientation or, or party affiliation, or for that matter, geography? Um, we're used to, in American surveys, we are used to seeing this broken down by age group and, and other demographics. Do you mean, do you mean at it? Do you mean attitudinal? Do you mean attitudinal differences on attitudinal questions or the survey overall? Okay. okay, survey overall. The sample. Uh, Dennis, you're Dennis, you're muted. If I understand correctly uh, the question. Well, we have a uh, national representative sample. It reflects the uh, structure of the uh, population. So it, uh, we have uh, all uh, groups of people represented, uh, not only from big cities, but also for, from uh, uh, small towns and rural areas. So it is, uh, well, it is representative uh, on the national national level, all the federal districts. So it's uh, in this sense, it's it's rep uh, reflects the overall structure of the population which we get from the national census. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I have a related question in terms of the uh, the views that were presented in Russia. There seemed to be a disconnect in, in terms of the question about taking pride, taking pride in, in Russia. Of course, you know, you would expect a high uh, a positive response to that. But when it came to uh, um, continuing the war, if there is uh, adverse effects, to the households and the economy, there seemed to be more, you know, a, a, a more positive response to that, or, or, or negative rather, and and so I'm wondering how do you kind of um, uh, uh, separate a a response that's based on perhaps what is politically correct to answer, you know, such as of course we take pride in Russia, but. Uh, uh, being able to be candid and open about um, um, doubts about the war and 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 its impact uh, on on the average Russian does does that make sense my my question okay mm, let me try to answer uh, we of course we do not uh, quite often we don't know uh, how people well uh, what people actually think and uh, so we only have what they are uh, ready to share with the uh, with the um, uh, interviewer uh, but it uh, more or less reflects their uh, public attitude how they are ready to act on public not only well, or say what well, they are ready to say in public but how they are ready to act uh, on public and uh, but uh, and i think of course the numbers of people who actually maybe choose to 
rather only join the majority, it can vary. But at the same time, at the same time, I think it is uh, important to see uh, all the data that we have in dynamics and uh, see that already, uh, already when nothing have yet happened, we already had two third, uh, two thirds of Russians supporting what uh, Putin is uh, was doing, and uh, the majority was blaming the West and so on and so forth. So the contours of the uh, attitudes towards uh, this conflict was already there, uh, already uh, before the actual conflict uh, began. So in this sense, I think it is uh, it. Uh, because uh, some of well, the critics argue that it's uh, after the um, not only the conflict ha started but the sanctions the repressions increased on those who were not uh, who, who are not uh, supporting it but uh, actually the start of the conflict changed not that much in the well numbers of people who support or don't support well, it, it did, but uh, not that much. So in this sense, uh, the, uh, the, well, the new events and new, uh, the hardening of uh, pressure on the society didn't uh, bring much, uh, much change. In this sense, I, I think that uh, having this in mind, we can say that uh, well, this uh, this uh, uh, these numbers are probably are fine, but of course, all, all the uh, all all this is happening within the well growing pressure. But uh, uh, public opinion is, as I understand, works uh, this way that it it uh, answers the pressure which uh, which is there, and the people choose to to answer and uh, behave. Uh, as they see fit in these uh, circumstances. So, but of course, it's very hard to uh, say for sure that these people are uh, speaking candidly and these people are well, just joining the majority. That's why it's important. That's why it's important to ask a series of different questions so you can try to measure things in different ways. So, so like that was why it's important to sh we show, okay, a large majority, at least somewhat, support the military action. But yet when you ask about, well, should we move to peace negotiations, a, a, a very high percentage, um, depending on how you ask it, do think that it's time to start negotiations. So I think you take the two together and and get a more nuanced view. And, and you can tell then that the really strong supporters, the true believers, don't want to don't want to stop fighting until they get everything that they want to achieve, the government wants to achieve. But others are more flexible and uh, maybe hedge their bets, saying that they support the military action. But if you give them other options, they might, in in terms of questions. Uh, that's why we ask things in different ways. So if you give them the option of, okay, now it's time to start a peace negotiation, many of them, especially the not solid supporters, will take that option. And also it is important to differentiate between different groups of support and uh, to speak about the origin of support, which is, which is not uh, uh, active. It's rather passive. Uh, it's uh, both with... Uh, 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 fighting and both with uh, Putin himself. I mean, there is a group of, of strong support and uh, also big group of uh, circumstantial support. And uh, at the same time, we see that, yes, people are ready to uh, say that they're supporting, declare their support, but at the same time, they are not willing to act upon, upon it. Cool. Okay. Hello. Uh, my name is Stanislav, and uh, my family moved from uh, Ukraine some times ago. And uh, as I know, the Levada Center um, has a wide experience 
in uh, measuring uh, public opinion in Russia for a long time. And uh, how do you think, uh, is there any chance that Russian citizens would change their attitudes to the military operation significantly? And what conditions should push them, push them to this direction? Well, I understand that uh, Stepan is disconnected. Um, so I, I again will take uh, this question. I think uh, it is important to have uh, first to have uh, um, different points of view allowed in uh, mass media. I think it's very important to have public debate on what is happening uh, or, or on the responsibility of. Uh, uh, what Russia is doing, and uh, with the predominant uh, uh, official narrative, uh, with uh, uh, TV being still the most important source of information, which is closely controlled by the government, uh, I think we should not expect a uh, big variation, uh, though we already have some variation with the internet gaining some uh, some uh, uh, recognition and usage and so on and so forth. But I think uh, the main condition is uh, free uh, debate over the most influential media. Only then I, I, I think we can have some re-evaluation. Denise, uh, what do what you think? Going. Do you think that if there is a, a general mobilization, another one that is less targeted toward those with military experience and is even broader, do you think that would depress support? No, uh, of course, uh, I think that uh, the, well, they can be several uh, events that can uh, change the attitudes. Uh, it is, uh, uh, and uh, mobilization is one of them, though I think uh, uh, we'd rather have uh, if we have, we'd have the second wave of uh, uh, partial mobilization, which I think uh, will, of course, uh, uh, affect negatively of the attitudes. First of all, I think it will increase the number of people who would like to have uh, uh, peace talks. But I think the second wave will be will have less uh, effect because uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that time it will be more understandable because more groups are already gained this. Um, uh, so they have this, I'm not sure about the word, the prevention from being recruited. The lists are already being made. And uh, so I think because of this, uh, uh, it, uh, if we have it, it will have negative effect on the su support. But uh, again, it, it uh, as I understand, I will I would uh, differentiate here uh, the support of um, the of what the government is doing and uh, the loyalty to, to the government and readiness to accept it. It's one thing, uh, but the question, uh, uh, as I understood it, was rather the overall change of the attitude of uh, speaking about the responsibility. And this, I think, is impossible without uh, the revelation in the mass media of some de public debate about it. Thank you very much. I, it seems to me that um, the data provided today are not much different than what we see in mass media about the situation. So I don't see any revelation in those uh, data. And uh, there could be a result in Russia, especially with, from the fact that there is no independent media in Russia. So the people are basically respond to what they hear from their TV and, and radio and, and read in the press. And uh, my question is, uh, it seems to me also that the, if you compare the public support of this war uh, in, in Ukraine with the public support of the war, previous war in, in Europe in 1939 invasion of Germany to Poland, you would find some similarities. I was wondering if anybody 
has uh, taken time of comparing those two situations for both the Russian uh, uh, public support versus German public support and American support to both wars. And that would be very interesting to, to look at the comparison and draw conclusions. Maybe they'll be similar to the previous war, who knows? Well, if uh, I need to react to this, so, well, in Russia, we only had uh, 30, uh, 35 years of uh, regular uh, survey, so it's uh, not that easy to uh, make this comparison, but uh, in the United States, of course, so with the long history of uh, public opinion surveys, I think, yes, it is possible. Uh, my name is Murad. I'm from Russia originally, um, and my maybe answer and question uh, just belongs to the since uh, sorry yeah. uh, about uh, how change mind of Russians uh, at this point. Uh, I think um, Denise already uh, partly answered that question. That the propaganda is very tough and very strong currently. And mass media works at this point, mass, mass media uh, making the, the political functions, uh, you know, being effective, very good, very well, and government uh, uses it very good. I uh, don't need to go far. I can even speak about my own experience. My mom, uh, I talk to her almost every day. She's in Russia, in South Russia. And no matter what I'm trying to explain to her, no matter like how I, you know, trying to give her some contradictory to the point what she can hear and see and the TV, it's, it just wouldn't work because especially for older uh, generation, let's say 45 and up, they listen what uh, media says, they listen what, you know, most of the public, you know, opinion, where that public opinion goes and they prefer to be with the majority you know, instead of having their own opinion and look at it wider, maybe. Um, and another thing, uh, we need to keep in mind the the level of education of the society of and you know, in a public, I you know, in a in a public opinion where we work uh, with with which we work with, which uh, I mean, uh, you know. People, we ask in question, we need to understand like what's the average level of education, how how they're able to consume information and get information from different sources and compare that and analyze. Not all the people, like not, mo well, most of the people not, not, not able to do that, even people like younger ones. So I think this is more about uh, propaganda, about um, mass media work and about uh, you know, how public opinion can change if society doesn't want to change itself, if society doesn't want to listen or understand, even though maybe like some part of, you know, that society understands and maybe they have their own opinion and voice, but it never will, it, it will never go through and we will never maybe hear that or see that because it will be like, you know, just cut off. Yeah, at this point. Thank you. Uh, Denise yeah, or, I agree. Or, yeah. Agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, actually, if I could just jump pug, piggyback on that question myself, just to add to it, is because Denise, you just mentioned in passing that there we have thirty about thirty five years of some kind of public opinion <clears throat> surveying in Russia, uh, and a much longer tradition of that in the United States. It would also seem that we have a tradition, a much longer tradition in the United States of having public opinions. <laughs> uh, that that when when a public when someone comes to us to ask us uh, these kinds of questions, we understand what it means to express your public opinion, as opposed, which is different from your private opinion sometimes, and then to have that information aggregated into uh, reporting. Is it possible that Russians don't really know what they're being asked? That actually, they, in fact, they don't have a culture of um, having a public opinion. Well, it's uh, an interesting question. Of course, um, well, it depends on how you look at uh, this thing. But 
on many issues, many people have some opinion and uh, they are actually uh, ready to, to share it. But, um, well, maybe it will not be the answer to your question, but um, in uh, recent, already in recent uh, 30, uh, 30, 35 years, the attitudes towards public opinion polls changed in Russia because in the early 90s, there were a lot of people who uh, would uh, love to share their opinion and wanted to share their opinion with the, uh, uh, not only to the uh, interviewers, but to the TV, to the uh, everywhere. But uh, then already by, I think, uh, by end of 90s, we saw the growing well, depression and uh, uh, more and more people uh, had an attitude that uh, it doesn't matter what kind of opinion they have. And uh, we saw that, uh, well, this attitude changed and uh, we have not so many people interested in uh, uh, taking part in uh, uh, public opinion surveys. We also see that uh, less people are interested in working uh, uh, on talking to TV, for example, in the streets. So in this sense, we already in this uh, short term have different uh, periods of uh, and different levels of uh, uh, willingness of people to sharing their opinion with the with the well uh, different agencies so yeah i'm not sure that it's uh, exactly uh, what you were asking about but uh, i think that uh, it's also interesting to uh, have well, bear in mind this change already within 30 years um according to russian independent media and my main source here is Medusa, which I read most days. The Kremlin itself does a lot of polling. Um, does anyone happen to know, are they asking the same sorts of questions? Are they using the same sorts of methods and getting the same sorts of results? And what, most of all, are they looking for when they conduct opinion polls? Well, uh, I here I can only speculate, but of course we see a lot of... Uh, uh, different uh, uh, surveys uh, done by the authorities, which are uh, closed and leaked to the press. Uh, I would say more or less they have uh, all they all more or less convey the same picture of what's going on. And uh, well, big uh, pollsters, one of them, state pollster, so on, uh, form closely working with the government. They are using the same methodology that we do. Uh, probably this uh, first of all, polls, closed polls, uh, they probably now also using the same methodology because they have the same results. Mm, uh, how they are used? Well, I think uh, they are, of course, uh, integrated in the, the system of uh, uh, maybe not making but providing political decisions because I think there is a big gap between this political level where Putin and his um, chaps uh, uh, making some political decisions, I'm not quite sure they always look at the public opinion polls. And uh, they're always aware of the, well, situation on the ground. Uh, well, the biggest, uh, uh, the biggest example for me, it's uh, public opinion in Ukraine, because probably they were expecting that uh, a lot of people in Ukraine would welcome Russian troops, which actually was not the case. And uh, everyone who knew the public opinion polls in Ukraine understood it well in advance. But, but, uh, uh, but when the decision is made, then I think uh, all these uh, public opinion polls are used to uh, get deal with these opinions and to uh, to make it make sense and sometimes to sell the public the decisions made upstairs. So I think this is uh, uh, not always straightforward, but so of course they uh, use heavily uh, these results in their daily work. Um, but on the, I would say, the lower level of um, authorities. 
we have a, a question that came in uh, over Zoom from one of our, audi our online audience members uh, about the source of news, uh, specifically political news uh, for everyday Russians. Do we know statistically where Russians are consuming their political news? Uh, and, and do we know how that breaks down between traditional mass media, television, newspapers, radio, versus uh, the internet or um, encrypted online uh, chats like uh, or messaging services like Telegram? Do we know whether people are actually getting their political news from Telegram or are they getting it from uh, uh, state uh, media? No, the bigger part gets uh, their news from TV, it's uh, 60 something, and uh, predominantly all the generations. About, um, I think a little bit less than 40%, uh, predominantly young people get, the, uh, uh, get their news from uh, uh, different uh, sources on the internet, uh, social networks, internet sources. Uh, of course, there is a difference between uh, TV, which is uh, uh, straightforward one, I mean, like uh, almost one channel uh, uh, controlled by the government and the, in the internet, different uh, confusing sources. And uh, speaking of the telegram, I think this was the major change uh, of this year when telegram went up from 6% to 20 percent now and the biggest rise came in uh, in march and april uh, with uh, 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 and but telegram now it is uh, what is important telegram is um, text media so it is uh, interest uh, well it's uh, it is for people who are the most interested in what's going on who is interested in text and the major public are interested in of course in video and this is tv and uh, YouTube. YouTube, I think, uh, in Russia is used by about uh, a little bit less than a third of uh, the public, but regularly. And because of this, uh, media like uh, Dost, like uh, YouTube channels of the Ducts of Duty are so important. And of course, closure of Dost, uh, which we saw only recently, uh, didn't, uh, doesn't help to provide. Uh, uh, provide um, alternative media, but I think it is of, of, of very important, crucial to provide uh, some uh, alternative uh, uh, alternative video content uh, 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 different than this uh, state state media. Yeah, but it's what we are having. Hello. Um... Hi, uh, I'm a master's student here at the University of Michigan. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us uh, over Zoom. Um, I had a question um, regarding, in 2016, uh, the Levada Center was designated as a foreign agent by the Kremlin. I'm curious on how this has affected the perception within um, Russian respondents, and if this perhaps um, makes them a bit more suspicious to answer truthfully, believing wrongfully that your organization might be a foreign agent. Well, what, what saves us is that uh, not uh, many people know about it. <laughs> to the designated foreign agent. Yeah, well, the majority do not follow. It's, it is more about the overall attitude that if somebody is designated foreign agent, well, he is bad. He's under uh, uh, influence from abroad, which is actually now in the would introduced into the law this uh, this term, but uh, well, majority doesn't care and doesn't know who actually foreign agents are, and this this helps to go on with uh, the work. As you say, uh, independent media and independent organizations in Russia have had a much more difficult time lately. And uh, I'm wondering about the Levada Center. Is your working environment more difficult now than it would have been, uh, let's say, two or three years ago? 
Yes, and uh, uh, especially there was this new uh, tightening, tightening of this law, which came uh, on 1st of December. We just, we haven't yet understood it well, how it will affect our work, though we have uh, now put a big, uh, this big uh, signs that we are foreign agents on our, all our publication, which was not the case for organizations until recently. Uh, but the whole climate uh, with uh, almost uh, wartime censorship, it doesn't help to work. Uh, though, uh, and uh, several organizations were closed. Dost was closed, Tech Moscow was closed, uh, but it's more about, uh, and first of all, um, uh, the media but also one of the uh, most important uh, organization dealing with the uh, uh, memory of repressions of Soviet repression memorial was closed down uh, at the beginning of, uh, of this year. So yes, the climate is, uh, is, uh, is not good, but uh, well, we decided that we will go, uh, go on with our work uh, uh, when it is possible. So we are not making this decision ourselves. Let's the government to uh, take these decisions if they want. Uh, they haven't yet, so we go on with our work. That might be the perfect note on which to concludes, conclude today's event. Um, we've actually gone several minutes past our normal uh, ending point. Uh, I'm sorry if any of you are holding quest holding on to any questions we didn't get to answer. Uh, uh, Lena uh, will be still here um, after the Zoom closes. So uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you those who, uh, of you who joined us over Zoom. Um, it's a wonderful way to conclude uh, a semester and especially the first fairly normal semester that we've had uh, on campus. It's really a, a real pleasure to see all of these faces, actual faces in front of me. Um, so thank you very much. And, and please uh, join me in one more round of applause for our group. OK, bye bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Glad bye. to be with you. Goodbye, Dina.